Jan, our executive producer, is from Canada, A. Eh? And when she found out that you were going to be on the show, she said, can I just say hi? So, Kathy, meet Jan. Jan, one Calgarian to another. I'm from Crestmont. Big Are hello. you serious? I am totally serious, sister. And I miss cross-country skiing in, Bre in Bragg Creek. I'm dying for some of that right now. Right, Kathy, I, I don't okay. need to be insensitive, Kathy, but we have an interview to do. Insensitive, yeah. Nice transition. Kathy. I, I live I live five minutes from Bragg Creek. I was just oh there yesterday. God. You're blowing my mind. You're blowing my mind. Okay, we gotta, we value your time. You're a goddess. Thank you so much for coming on our show. We love you. Oh. Jan, you know, so many times we say to somebody, they were born to do this. You say that you were basically born to do this. You think you were singing before you were crying as a baby. The, the funny thing is, is that I wanted to be a school teacher. I, uh, that was my dream as a kid. I, in the, in my parents' basement, I had the chalk out on the chalkboard and I was, you know, Miss Arden and, but I, you know, life doesn't always do that for you. Sometimes it just picks you up and has you doing things that you never dreamed of. But yeah, it's been a long career. An interesting story about Houston, Texas that I really want to tell you is that many years ago in the nineties, uh, I had a little song insensitive that was kind of a hit all over the world. It broke out of Houston, Texas. There was a DJ at a radio station down there that just started playing it on his show. It just spread out from America, from Houston, Texas. So thank you, thank you to everybody down there because you guys had a lot to do with me sitting, talking to you today. Uh, we recognize good talent. You know, the other thing you were yes, doing you in your do. basement is that you were writing songs. You would write songs and you would sing and you say your parents really didn't know that you loved it so much until much later in your childhood. Oh, I hid it for a long time. I was, you know, uh, uh, the class clown. And when I started writing music, I was really young. Um, not to be morbid, because, you know, we want to, we're talking about a comedy, but my dad was a huge drinker. And so in order to get out of his way when I was 9, 10, 11 years old, I went into my parents' basement. The record player was down there, all the records. My mom had a guitar sitting in the corner. And I just started playing that guitar, copying songs. And then I started making up my own songs. I didn't want anyone to know. So it wasn't until I graduated high school, like seven, eight years later, when I was 18 years old, I sang a song for my high school graduating class. And it was the first time that my mom and dad had heard me sing. And my mom said to me, I didn't even know you liked music. <laughs> and, you know, so it was just one of those things. And the rest, as they say, I just, I never was able to get away from music for the next yeah. 25 years. And in so many ways, I would imagine music was therapy for you, but it was also therapy for those of us listening to it. We were able to take a journey with you that a lot of us can kind of go side by side with you, uh, dealing with your parents. As kids, oftentimes we don't understand or fully appreciate them. And as we get older, you start to realize how they've integrated into your life. You mentioned your dad was an alcoholic and sometimes means emotionally unavailable, but when it counted, you were count the times when he was there for you, he encouraged you. Very much so. I, I can glean, my, my, my dad's been gone for about five years, but I can certainly glean really good lessons from him now. Not when he was alive, I have to be honest. I, I feel like I know him better now that he's gone. Um, and my mom's been gone for a couple of years and she is just, she was always my champion. They were the antithesis of each other, those two. It's hard to believe that I was, I was, uh, that, that they even got married and they were together for almost 60 years, but very grateful. There's so many lessons to be learned from, from having obstacles in your way, from not getting it right, from failing, from having a parent that's not available. I think, you know, good things do come from bad things. And I'm very grateful to both my parents. As, as much as we were all flawed, they always supported my work. They always yeah. supported me. And your mom went through Alzheimer's, which we know millions of oh. other people are going through kind of that long goodbye. And you, you shared that with us as well. Yeah. The interesting thing about the television, the Jan show, is that who would have thought that you'd have a, a character uh, with dementia in the show? And it's very heartfelt at moments, but sometimes it's hysterically funny. So mom and I have been talking and we've mm -hmm. decided that she's going to come live with you for a bit. What? I have to say, I looked after my mom for 10 years, and sometimes I wanted to throw her through a wall. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I was Very so frustrating. frustrated. I just, uh, and then there was times where I laughed so hard 
that I was just like, this is so sublime and so ridiculous. This this doesn't even seem real, but <clears throat> excuse me. It, uh, that's what we're able to, to portray on the show. Deborah Grover, who plays my mother in the show, is so fantastic and funny. And she just brings so much to it. Dementia is not easy. And sometimes you have to just lean into it and go, well, what else can I do? She's going to yeah. repeat herself 18 million times. And I'm going to have to either go with it or sink. So I didn't want to sink. I wanted to be, I wanted to go where my mom went. And I did learn that. Lord, oh my Lord, could I be a girl? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. The Jan Show is kind of a sum of all your parts where we can laugh, but at the same time, we're all kind of taught a, a valuable lesson. So for those people who don't know the premise of the show, you, you mentioned that it's kind of a slice of your life, but you've added some things to it. Wow. You really look like Jan Arden. Actually, I, I do not care for her. I mean, you don't have to know anything about Canada to understand this show. This is about me, a woman, in her middle aged, <laughs> and she's trying to find relevance with her relationships, with her job, with her family. How is she going to navigate life? Um, it's tons of physical comedy. It, it, is, it, it really is about trying to figure out what to do with a parent who's just starting down that road of having memory loss. And, you know, the whole family realizes it, but everybody is like, you take her. No, you take her. Um, my sister, who's played by an actress named Zoe Palmer, is fantastic. She's the straight person. She is the person that wants to have everything, you know, tied off with a bow. She wants order. And I'm just like, chaos. This is a very stressful situation. I think that's Jan Arden. I think I frustrate everybody, but it, it's really a very fun show. It's very musical. So people that like to hear music and uh, I do some singing in the show and um, it, it, I think it's hilarious. I'm not drunk, I'm just sad. <laughs> Can you let me out of here? Oh, well, you're not under arrest and uh, the door is open. Oh. It's hilarious because you actually are hilarious. You talk about, you know, where that humor comes from. There's a story that you told that I that I read or heard that I thought was so funny is when you had that hit insensitive in America and you're with a record executive and the record executive says to you, you're 30 pounds away from superstardom. And you tell yeah. your mother that and your mother's response was what? Uh, yeah, I was in a limousine and he looked over and sensitive was a huge hit in the States and it was going everywhere. And I was, they were flinging me around all over the place. And he did, he leaned over, you're 30 pounds away from superstardom. I ran, I phoned my mom, collect in those days. Hi, this guy. She said, well, why didn't you tell him you didn't want to put on any more weight? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Uh, okay. Hall of Fame 2020. It's one of those things that every time I talk to somebody who, who was inducted into the Hall of Fame, they always say, I didn't see it coming. The rest of us did, but they're like, I didn't see it coming. And then when it does, that feeling that everything you've done up until this point has been totally validated if you needed it. I'm still quite shocked about it. And of course, COVID came along. Uh, last year was 2020 that I was inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. And it's, I'm not huge on awards because I don't think you can win in the arts, but the Hall of Fame is different because I think it's recognizing someone for putting in their time, for being on the road, and being a road dog and singing on street corners and singing in bars where your feet sticks to the stage and everyone's hammered around you. And sometimes you're just playing to like the waitress and the bartender and you're in the, you're up by Alaska somewhere thinking to yourself, what am I doing with my life? That's, I think, what the Hall of Fame is about. It's about recognizing the time that you've put into your work. And I'm very grateful. I will cherish it my whole life long. And I want my opportunity to give my 90-second speech someday, Deborah, like in front of people. We will give you a chance to do that. You come back to Houston because we know we love you here from the beginning. But Jan, thank you very much for making us laugh, especially in this time when more of us need to be able to laugh. We'll get there, Deborah. We're going to get there. Steady on, everybody.